Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Beacom, the Marketing Specialist here at Altair Global. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, 2018 Mid-Year Trends Update. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to address a few quick housekeeping items. Altair has submitted this webinar to Worldwide ERC for both one CRP recertification credit and one GMS recertification credit. We've also submitted the webinar to the Human Resources Certification Institute for one hour or of general HR credit. Both ERC and HRCI use a self-surface model for submitting credit, and we have included the activity IDs and instructions on how to request credit on the continuing education slide in the presentation handout. That brings me to my next point. If you'd like to keep a copy of today's webinar for reference, please feel free to download the handout PDF we have provided today. You'll want to go to your GoToWebinar menu list, click the little arrow by the handout section, and download the listed file. Lastly, please be advised that your phones have been muted by our phone system. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit it in the question and answer window on your screen. We'll try to respond to each question at the end of the session. Today's speakers are all part of our global cons consulting services team, which include Mary Beth Nitz, Russ Haney, and Allison Gurley. Mary Beth here is Altair Global's Vice President of Global Consulting Services. She's been in the relocation industry for over 25 years now, offering our clients extensive knowledge in HR, global consulting, and relocation topics. A little fun fact about Mary Beth, she actually auditioned for the popular music competition show, The Voice, a few years back. Mary Beth, what did you sing for that? Uh, I sang Before He Cheats by Carrie Underwood but I didn't make it past the producer's audition. Oh, uh, well, that's, <laughs> that's a shame, but that's quite a hefty song to go with. I love it. <laughs> All right, well, moving on here, we've got Russ Haney. He's our second panelist for today. He's the Director of Global Consulting Services here at Altair Global. Russ is a new face here at Altair Global, having been here with the team for almost five months, but has worked in the relocation industry for over 25 years as well. A fun fact on Russ, on a random weekend run, he decided to push himself to see how far he could go and ended up running 18 miles. Now, I don't know about y'all on the line, but that's a long distance for a random run. How did that make you feel, Russ? <laughs> it made me feel like if I ever really wanted to run a marathon, I probably could. And I also learned that I never really want to run a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you on that one, The power to you. And lastly here, we have Allison Gurley, serving as our Manager of Global Consulting Services here at Altair Global. Allison has been with the Altair team for seven and a half years. Having started out as a relocation consultant in her tenure with Altair Global, Allison is well-versed at bringing industry information to clients and preparing them for the future course of global mobility. A fun fact about Allison, she and her husband love to travel the world, usually with their two girls in tow. She says that Greece has always been on her bucket list, and she will actually be headed there with her husband in exactly one week from today. That's exciting. Do you have anywhere in mind that you're gonna head, go out to there? Yeah, absolutely. So the history nerd in me is just pretty excited that um, I'll be standing at the Parthenon, I'll be visiting Delphi. So I'm, I'm right. kind of nerding out about the history portion of it, but super excited about the beaches as well. That's awesome, well enjoy that. Well, before we get to the beaches of Greece, we're going to go ahead and pass the mic over to you and let you begin. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. So let's kick things off looking at the current state of real estate. Where have all the houses gone? The 30,000 foot view of America's housing market is one in which housing is growing increasingly scarce and expensive. Based on the 30th annual State of the Nation's housing report, while new home construction has grown every year since 2008, the cost of materials, labor, and land have contributed to a decrease in pace, and therefore, we are now seeing the effects in the way of decreased availability of new homes. As for available inventory, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development reports that as of June, the listed inventory of new homes nationwide represents a 5.7-month supply of inventory, which is up slightly from May, and listed existing homes are at a 4.3 month supply, also up slightly from May. Overall, however, inventory rates haven't changed much from a year ago, which means that 
market, the market is continuing to absorb the inventory just as quickly as it's being added and in turn not really providing much relief for buyers. So what's driving the inventory issues? Well, for the past several years, there's been a lot of talk about um, you know, the millennials, that four-letter word, and, and are they going to choose to enter uh, the housing market or not? Um, so far, we kind of generally believe that they uh, stuck to renting because it was a lot easier. However, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, for the first time in a decade, homeownership rates actually ticked upward in 2017, and that pattern is showing to continue in 2018, currently sitting at 64.3%. So this seems to indicate that maybe some of those buyers who were sitting on the sidelines are now choosing to finally dip their toe into that homeownership pool. We've also heard a lot about this looming silver tsunami where it's predicted that baby boomers would be retiring in mass at this point. But that hasn't really panned out either. This is likely due in large part to the Great Recession decimating many of those retirement plans. That coupled with the lack of general savings means boomers are now in a position where it continued Steady income is still necessary for many of them. This also means that much of this population is staying put in their homes for the time being, which is keeping those inventory rates of step-up homes um, lower. We also can't ignore the rise in home values. According to Zillow, homes have steadily risen in recent years and have since surpassed pre-recession highs. The home value index in February 2007, which was the highest pre-recession, was around $196,500. The current home value index is slightly above $213,000. Not only is this ahead of pre-recession value, but it represents an 8% increase year over year from 2017 and a 44.6% increase since the lowest point in the recession. Also, mortgage rates continue to, to slowly but surely rise. Bankrate.com reports that the current 30-year fixed rate mortgage is at 4.73%. Mortgage rates are safe at least for another month as the Fed recently declined to increase interest rates in August. They did, however, set the stage for a September hike. So what does this mean to a buyer? Increases in interest rates, even small ones, mean a lot more money spent on a mortgage over 30 years. When you consider that the interest rate was around 4.1%, in 2015 versus where it sits now, the resulting added cost to home buyers is an average of $42,000 over the life of the loan, according to Wallet Hub. This is certainly a case where waiting to buy will likely cost you a lot in the long run. Well, it's summertime in the U.S., and that typically equals a ramp up for real estate activity. So let's take a look at some of the fastest moving markets in the U.S. Believe it or not, for the third month in a row, the fastest growing market in all of the U.S. is Midland, Texas. This is according to Realtor.com and is based on how long it takes to sell a house and the number of buyers in the market. Lawrence Yoon, who is the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, attributes this to Midland's 11% job growth in the last 12 months, which is seven times that of the, na of the national average. For those of you not familiar with Midland, um, they have a lot of ties to the oil and gas industry. The top five of Realtor.com's list of fast-moving markets is rounded out by Fort Wayne, Indiana, Boise City, Idaho, San Francisco, and Columbus, Ohio. But unfortunately, it's not all multiple offers and bidding wars for everyone. According to the same list, the five coolest markets for July were Pueblo, Colorado, Buffalo, New York, Stockton, California, Fresno, California, and Odessa, Texas. So how are the rental markets looking? According to Business Insider, median asking rent for one-bedroom apartments across the U.S. rose 4% in June compared to a year ago, currently at a little over $1,200 per month. And for a two-bedroom, it rose 3.7% to almost $1,450 per month. But these averaged out national figures hide the city by city drama on the ground with rents plunging in some of the largest and most expensive metros, but soaring by 10 to 15% in many others. So really depending on geography, renters are feeling either some major relief or painful rent inflation. Which of the major markets are seeing some relief? Well, over the past year, New York City has seen a drop in median rent value of 3% for a one bedroom. And it's important to note that this is also a 15% drop from the peak 
in March 2016. Chicago is also seeing a major freefall where a one bedroom medium rent has plunged 10% from a year ago and nearly 16% from the October 2015 peak. For a two bedroom, rates have dropped even more sharply down 32% from the peak in September 2015. Other notable drops are in Honolulu, down 5.6% year over year, and Washington, D.C., which only saw a 2.3% drop in one bedroom rent, but a staggering 16% drop in two bedroom rent. Meanwhile, San Francisco remains the country's most expensive major retail market. And while one bedroom rents are up 1.4% year over year, it's still important to note that the rates are down 4.6% from the peak in 2015. So which major markets are heating up? Well, pretty much all of California. All of their major markets have shown significant rent value increases year over year. Atlanta's one bedroom median rate jumped 14% since last year and 13% for two bedrooms. And several other notable 10% or greater jumps are found in Denver, Minneapolis, Nashville, Houston, Orlando, and Austin. With inventory issues across many markets, both buying and renting, it can be a tough call as to if buying makes sense. This is especially true in a relocation situation where there may be a benefit provided for purchasing, but there's also a real possibility the employee could be asked to move again in the next five years. This graphic demonstrates markets where it's most advantageous to buy, which are the markets in green, versus those where the realized savings of owning a home is more cost neutral, seen as the markets in red, and perhaps maybe more of a long-term investment. A relocating employee would need to weigh the cost of buying against their plan and their plans and their career goals. If the reality is that a move in the near future is possible, buying in many of these red markets would probably make less financial sense. There is certainly a tipping point where buying begins to pay off, however. This infographic from Zillow actually demonstrates the metro areas where it takes the most amount of time to tip that scale back in a buyer's favor. Probably not surprising to many, four of the top five are locations in California where inventory continues to be a pain point. So now that we've touched on markets with the greatest median time frame to realize the financial benefits of buying, we'll pause here for an audience polling question. Okay, everyone, you should see a quick poll up on your screen asking what is the median time frame in years for all of the U.S. to realize the advantage of buying over renting. Go ahead and select one of the following options. We'll give a couple seconds for you to make your answers. While we're compiling the answers, here's a fun fact for you. If you're looking for the cheapest city to rent in America, well, that would be Wichita, Kansas. Average rent for May 2018 was a whopping $634 a month. That's followed closely by Tulsa, Oklahoma at $669 a month and Toledo, Ohio at $699 a month. Okay, we'll give you a couple more seconds here. Go ahead and make those answers if you haven't already. Okay, so it looks like a majority of you at 40% said 3.4 years. What do you think about that, Allison? Well, according to Zillow, it's actually 2.1 years is the median break-even point across the U.S. All right, so maybe a little bit more so. Yeah, so just a side note before we move on that there are many rent versus buy and mortgage calculators out there on the internet. We do just want to stress the importance of discussing all of the costs associated with owning a home with a mortgage professional before making any decisions. For example, there are many people who have never owned a home before who really aren't aware of property tax impacts or the added cost of utilities when owning a home. These can be significant costs that may not be accounted for when using those free online tools. All right, let's move on here. We know the issue of tax reform has been covered thoroughly by everyone, but we did want to quickly touch on the recent Alter Advisor 
on states' positions on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's important to note that most states do follow the federal tax code fairly closely, but no state conforms 100%. 10 states have formally realigned with the federal tax code and seven have already formally deviated in some way on the moving deduction changes. Examples are noted on this slide, but keep in mind, this is a completely fluid situation as states continue to pass individual legislation. So what does Altair recommend to address these variations? We do believe that ultimately most states will choose to conform with federal tax code when it comes to moving deductions. And our recommendation is that our clients follow the federal position on taxability as part of their overall gross up methodology. While this approach can result in excess gross up for some in those states that deviate, it should overall help alleviate significant administrative work and clean up later on as we navigate this year of transition. If you would like to receive a copy of that Altair advisor on this topic, please feel free to reach out to your client services or business development representative. We'd be happy to provide it to you. And now we're going to turn it over to Russ for a little bit more information on HR technology and mobility policy. Russ? Thank you, Allison. I am so excited to join the webinar today. Um, the next couple of trends I'm going to cover are really near and dear to me. They've really been front and center with a lot of the work that we've done with clients recently. Um, the first trend I'd like to cover today is how we see HR tech initiatives influencing the design of our clients' mobility policies. HR technology platforms might be called H, uh, Human Resources Information Systems, or HRIS, or you might hear it called a Human Resources Management System, HRMS, and there's many other variations and names out there. But whatever the name used, we see these platforms introducing a user interface focus into mobility benefits and an opportunity to meet the ever diversifying needs of assignees, transferees, and mobility business stakeholders. Uh, we're all familiar with concepts such as drop down list, character limits, click through content, supplier systems integration, process automation, push notifications and continuous performance management. These are concepts that are all leading to changes in how benefit policies, including those for mobility, are developed, written, presented, and maintained. And increasingly, the full policy document, that traditional paper document, is more and more reserved in the background of program administration. And today, we really see that as more of a governing document that drives content presented in these HR tech platforms. While there's still a place for that document-oriented policy, increasingly mobility policy content is being presented in these tech integrated formats. You might see the use of dynamic kind of hyperlink summaries and concise single screen scope of content. The organization of this click-through content is an increasingly important consideration for mobility teams as it enables a diversified presentation of benefit materials either based on some com combination of employee preference or choice, their profile, or their situation or circumstance. High-tech applications are also facilitating mobility and talent management integration by enabling shared access to policy content, program data, and supplier resources, which enables frontline decision-making among recruiters and HR business partners. The platforms also facilitate data collection and mining, and strategic initiative collaboration, which might involve a larger cross-functional team. So this is really quickly emerging as an evolution from talent management to true team management orientation. And with that, I think we have a polling question. We do indeed. Let me get it up here. I'm going to go ahead and launch this. Okay, so our next question is, please select the response that best describes HR tech's impact on your mobility program. We'll go ahead and give you a few seconds for that. Okay, I'm seeing the numbers trickling in here. I do see, oh, it's actually it's starting to level out here. There was a trend and it seems like we have, as more we people we have vote, the less of a leading trend there is. Okay, a couple more seconds, and then we'll go ahead and close the poll, get those votes in.
And we are closing. Let's take a look at these results. All right, Russ, I'm curious on your take with 38% of people not saying that they do not yet have a strong impact. Actually, I love that result because it really reinforces something that we know to be true and I'll speak to in a minute, which is that um, a lot of organizations are really at the beginning stages of implementing this kind of HR technology. So I'm not surprised to see it, but I'm also very, um, I think it's a very nice result to see that it's leading for many of our participants to an integration of talent management and mobility, which also reinforces some of what we're beginning to see with these trends. Um, so thank you for taking the um, time for the poll, everyone. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to um, discuss further uh, this of kind of a movement away from that document-oriented or traditional paper policy culture in our industry. It's actually enabling a more complex and responsive mobility benefit structure. Um, we're seeing policy customi customization based on employee profile, departure and destination locations, the business motivation for mobility, budget constraints, among all kinds of other considerations. These are all made possible through the integration with HR technology and the more complex matrix-oriented decision-making that it can enable for organizations. This migration toward automated, complex decision-making, in other words, artificial intelligence or AI, should lend increasing confidence to organizations to effectively manage a flexible if-then style of decision-making around mobility benefits. It also further enables an evolution of the mobility function away from a tactical gatekeeper role toward a more consultative or strategic partner role. We also see tech-enabled policies evolving toward accommodation of more employee choice via core flex policy types in the past, companies were maybe reticent to accommodate this give and take in policy, but increasingly we're seeing confidence that the downstream accounting, reporting, tax, and compliance concerns that come with that flexibility can be mitigated through system and supplier integration that these HR tech platforms provide. So on the next slide are some key takeaways. First, I would say don't panic if you feel behind the curve. Um, almost 40% of you indicated uh, through the polling question that these HR tech uh, platforms are not yet really having a major influence on your program. And recent research in the field of HR technology indicates that many companies are still struggling through the basics. A recent Deloitte High Impact HR or HIHR research study uh, showed that about 45% of companies are still focused on basic process automation. Only about 40% of companies today are moving on and using the next generation of cloud-based human capital management or HCM platforms. Mobility integration into HR technology initiatives also tends to lag other priorities within organizations like payroll or tax or other benefits. But it's never too early to begin to challenge your colleagues and peers to frame mobility decision making today with an eye toward these emerging technology trends. And then lastly on this topic, I wanted to give you some key questions to consider. Um, first, how can today's document-oriented mobility policies be reorganized to anticipate a more tech-driven application of benefits? And I think the hint here for the response would be that it can really be as simple as adopting a cascaded content organization that really anticipates a click-through system or app-enabled presentation of benefits. It could also be about segregating content that is universally applicable to all mobility scenarios from content customized to a range of employee preferences, choices, profiles, or situations. Next, how might technology inform a performance focus with regard to mobility benefits? As I've mentioned, there's a lot being said today about continuous performance management, and HR technology is increasingly focused on enabling companies to provide ongoing real-time performance metrics and feedback in place of those traditional annual performance reviews that we all know and love. 
it might be a good time to start thinking about opportunities for integrating, for instance, reward and recognition opportunities into mobility benefit design and administration. And it could be as simple as an acknowledgement of accomplishment of a key milestone in the relocation process or the assignment life cycle. Uh, that kind of um, reward and recognition can motivate employees to meet their obligations to perform tasks well and in a timely manner. Just whatever you do, remember to keep it simple and fun. And then um, lastly, how can HR technology be leveraged toward a focus on employee experience as a guiding principle for mobility program design? And here it may be helpful to consider that technology might enable the merging of initiatives related to areas such as talent recruiting, onboarding, performance management, et cetera. And if mobility isn't a current top priority for HR tech initiatives in your company, begin to pay close attention to how other HR disciplines are brought into the fold and begin to frame your decisions with a focus on gaining a head start. It might be as simple as harmonizing the language and terminology and tone of mobility benefit content with that of other functional areas. And then lastly, you may consider just simply inviting functional representatives who have a head start on technology initiatives to take part in your, mobi your mobility strategy um, discussions. So with that, I want to move on to a second trend I'd like to cover today, which is um, a focus on career development policies. There's been a lot written and said in our industry about the integration of talent management and mobility and the emergence of mobility policies specifically focused on career development is definitely a direct outgrowth of that trend. It's increasingly a well-established practice to consider the strategic importance and purpose of global mobility when developing policy. Increasingly, companies are developing policies that apply benefits according to the developmental goals of the transfer or assignment, not just the level of the employee or the expected duration of the assignment. Those are still important factors to consider, of course, but now it's more about purpose and the relationship of benefits to career development goals that are clear overlays to these traditional policy delineations. I think this graphic on the slide uh, really uh, uh, illustrates that it's the intersection of developmental value for the employee and the business value for the employer that is guiding the application of mobility support today. It's not a new trend, but as we see it mature, we're starting to see more sophisticated approaches emerge. And so on the next slide, I would say that there's really two main directions that we've seen companies take with developmental assignments. First, in developing a separate and distinct development policy, some companies might take the route of scaling down benefits from an existing policy. And often companies will do this to capitalize on the motivations of the employee to accept a transfer or assignment as a way to gain experience and advance themselves personally and professionally. This is especially likely if the employee volunteers themselves for global opportunities or initiates the opportunity for themselves. In the past, we've seen companies hold a pretty firm line on denying benefits in these employee-initiated scenarios, but increasingly we see companies offering at least a baseline of support, especially if mutual developmental and strategic business benefits are recognized. In part, this has driven the emergence of the short-term assignment. Uh, it's increasingly a predominant policy type and that short-term assignment approach is effective in striking a balance between cost and the need to offer developmental opportunities down into levels of the organization that perhaps were previously not offered those opportunities. And then in the other camp, at the other end of the spectrum, we see companies that have actually stepped up to enhance an existing, an existing policy to demonstrate their commitment to key talent and uh, their eye toward that longer term retention well beyond the near term kind of tactical goals of a transfer or assignment. This investment is focused on ensuring developmental goals are achieved and recognize the strategic business value in the return on investment analysis that rationalizes transfer or assignment costs. For some companies, this might result in distinct policies that target high potential employees or policies built exclusively in support of leadership development initiatives. 
with that latter category, we often see policies developed that are specific to rotational short-term assignments that expose candidates to different parts of the global business. It's also resulting in a hybridization of policy types. And a good example of this are local plus policies that offer a compromise by avoiding the expense of a full-blown expatriate compensation package, but shore up localized benefits with limited allowances for things that typically would include perhaps housing or a contribution to offset cost of living differential. This makes the assignment feasible, but at the same time promotes a local experience as part of the employee's development. And with that, I think we have another polling question. We do. So let's launch this question. You should see on your screens which of the following best describes the current career development focus within your mobility program. Please take a moment and make your selection. All right, I already see some votes coming in. We've got a major curve here. Oh, exciting. Trend. Any guesses, <laughs> Russ? Um, I don't know. I, I can't even venture a guess. I'm just excited to see what the result is. Absolutely. We're gonna get I'm not rooting for never the reason, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. There is a clear trend here. We're going to give a few seconds more, make those votes before we close the poll. Thankfully, that one, Russ, seems to be getting the least amount of votes. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. That's good. I would be uh, heartbroken that my trend was a dud. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and close this poll. Here are your results. Large majority of you, 52% said often motivates employee mobility, but not a primary driver. And Russ, thankfully, 2% say never the reason for employee mobility. Oh, good. I love feeling validated. So thank you everyone for that result. But actually, I do like that we're seeing that it often motivates employee mobility, but it's not a primary driver. And I think that that really well sums up kind of the tug of war that we see going on between these strategic drivers for mobility and the more skill-oriented, skill transfer-oriented, and certainly the cost uh, considerations that kind of pull from the other direction. So thank you everyone for that result. That's terrific to see. Um, I want to um, share some key takeaways I think you can um, uh, take from this trend. Um, I would say first, when recognizing your contribution as a mobility professional to the developmental goals of your organization's employees and also the talent management goals of your organization at large, it's probably helpful to re revisit both the rationale for the policy structures you have in place today and the delineation of benefit levels that you have. A good, a good example of this is some recent cases we've seen of companies revisiting the rationale of um, taking a stance on a family accompaniment, particularly with all of the short-term assignments we're seeing today. You know, historically, most companies take the tact that um, short-term assignments are expected to be unaccompanied. And, um, you know, there's a lot driving that, certainly not the least of which is budget considerations and the need to kind of manage costs for these shorter-term assignments. But part of the compromise has been that, um, you know, recognition that the employee is motivated to take these shorter term assignments for the opportunity it gives them professionally. So the trade-off is asking them to endure a period of family separation. Um, there may be tax and immigration issues at play it as well when we talk about international assignments. But to, to some degree, we're beginning to see companies kind of revisit this notion. If you think about it, allowing family accompaniment, if not for the entire assignment, Perhaps it's more just frequent visitation opportunities for the family to visit the host location um, might be a way to acknowledge that the global experience of the family at large may contribute to a more successful outcome. And after all, if you think about it, um, an emerging leader in your company today may get sent out on longer term assignments of critical business importance in the future and having invested in giving the family that opportunity to experience international travel and living at an earlier stage of the employee's career may be a worthwhile investment. Further, consider that the notion of talent development may more broadly encompass employees at a later career stage. 
I increasingly see companies kind of challenging that traditional assumption about short-term assignments, that it should really focus on younger, early career professionals who are less likely to have spouses or partners or children. But increasingly, employees at later career stages are facing the need to evolve into their roles to see, uh, to suit the evolving needs of the business. And supporting this evolution with mobility benefits may also be well advised. And it it's kind of comes part and parcel of letting go of those old assumptions about employee profile. Another good takeaway is to focus on the opportunity for mobility to facilitate the download of experience employees gain while on assignment. Um, you can do this by looking for ways to integrate talent management at repatriation. One idea may be to require returning assignees to serve as a mentor for a future assignee. Um, and I would say that providing that kind of opportunity really demonstrates the value the company places on the employee's experience, but at the same time, it promotes the success of future assignments. And then lastly, I would challenge you to make decisions that really move beyond a, a myopic focus on benchmarking. Certainly the awareness of trends and the competitive landscape in your particular industry is always key, but some of the most successful approaches that we've seen are those that really are born out of relying on hearing what is really being said on the front lines of the business. So it's not just waiting for the statistical evidence to emerge that supports something as a common practice. It's also about really hearing the business need and responding. And it takes a little bit of bravery, a little bit of a leap of faith, but when we've seen companies kind of push the boundaries a bit and be brave and kind of uh, adopt these um, less statistically supported approaches, we've seen a lot of success. So with that, I uh, would love to turn it over now to Mary Beth Nitz to talk about managing privacy and risk. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate it. And I, I will say that when I suggested um, and recommended that the entire global consulting team partner together for this webinar, I don't think I was quite prepared for the two tough acts I was going to have to follow. So thank you to both you and Allison for such great information. Um, I get to talk about an incredibly exciting topic, managing privacy and risk. <laughs> Um, as I was doing some research for the webinar, I found a great quote by Albert Einstein who once said, I never think of the future, it comes soon enough. And while this is a really nice sentiment, it's not realistic in the world of global mobility. To be successful and to stay ahead of the curve, we must constantly preparing, be preparing for what the future is going to bring. And with that, it should come as no surprise that managing risk and addressing security issues are at the top of most global mobility professionals 2018 priorities list. Over the past several years, companies have really stepped up their safety and security programs, including an increased focus on conducting pre-assignment and pre-transfer security briefings for globally mobile employees, providing more comprehensive destination country resources and information, and making cultural training a core program benefit versus an optional or situational benefit. Now the challenge is for all of the mobility policy and program enhancements and preparations to be effective, global mobility teams really need to know where employees are at any given moment. This can result in the temptation to nanny or babysit international employees and to impose numerous tracking protocols to ensure international employees are never off the radar. Knowing where your international employees are is not just about safety and security. There's also a direct link to compliance with tax and immigration rules, which as we know has become increasingly important, especially since the OECD established the inclusive framework on BEPS, which is base erosion and profit shifting in June of 2016. Now on the flip side, 2017 also brought more and more focus on personal privacy which of course has been heightened due to GDPR. Just as our assignees and transferees are asking, we too must ask ourselves more frequently, who can track our data? What can others find out about us from our personal data? And how much information am I comfortable sharing? So the challenge for global mobility professionals through the end of 2018 and into 2019 will be striking a balance between the management of employee safety and potential risk. And I believe we have our last polling question. That's 
correct. You should see this question come up on your screen now. And let's all remember that this is the easy one because it's just a true or false. <laughs> <laughs> GDPR applies only to companies in the EU. Okay, I already see some responses trickling in. We seem to be having a swing to one side over the other, which is good if it's the right answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if it's if it's the right answer, then do I have to continue talking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple more seconds for you all to get your answers in, and then we'll be closing the poll. All right. Fantastic. Get these results up. Huge swing to the answer false. Yes, which is fantastic. Um, so obviously, when we talk about GDPR, um, excluding the participants in the webinar today, there are many who don't fully understand all of the parameters and impacts around the recent global data protection regulation rules, which we affectionately refer to as GDPR. And these, which, these went into effect on May 25th of this year. Risk Management Magazine provided some insight into the top nine misconceptions regarding GDPR. I'm not going to touch on all the bullets on this slide today. Rather, we plan to release this information in more detail via an Altair advisor. So be on the lookout for that in the next couple of months. Of course, we want to address the misconception we just noted in the polling question that only EU companies need to comply with GDPR. Actually, GDPR is designed to protect the personal data and privacy rights of EU citizens no matter where the processing of that data takes place. This means that any organizations that collect, record, or utilize EU citizens' data in any way, even businesses physically located outside the EU, must do so in compliance with GDPR. The law also impacts organizations that process EU personal data in relation to the offering of goods or services, a category those of us in the global mobility space would fall into. Again, this is regardless of the company's location. Taken generally, GDPR continues to protect citizens' data no matter where that data ends up. Another misconception is that if and when a data breach occurs, meeting the GDPR notification requirement is simple. You probably also all know the answer to this because I don't think there's a whole lot about GDPR that we would define as being simple, <laughs> correct? GDPR requires organizations to notify supervisory authorities within 72 hours after becoming aware that a data breach has occurred. That said, complying with this requirement is actually rather involved and it necessitates pretty complex and coordinated action. Organizations must have already developed the capability to deliver timely notifications as part of their data breach incident response preparedness. Doing so after the fact is going to be too late. Misconception number five on this slide, noncompliance with GDPR can mean substantial fines, but that is it. GDPR gives supervisory authorities the power to go well beyond fines where appropriate and allows those authorities to pursue corrective measures that can also include sanctions, lawsuits, and more. This means authorities might prescribe specific actions an organization must complete and a time frame for doing so, all on top of those hefty fines. Furthermore, a business could be banned from processing personal data or continuing with specific data handling practices. Where a disallowed practice is essential to an organization's revenue, these sanctions could easily end up being more expensive than the maximum fines under GDPR. Another misconception is that GDPR introduces a single new individual privacy right, the right to be forgotten. GDPR actually introduces a number of privacy rights that may not be present in existing regulatory frameworks and that organizations outside the EU may be unfamiliar with. So in addition to the right to be forgotten, these rights include, and I'm going to list them, I'm not going to provide a full description of each of them that will be provided in the Altair Advisor. So the additional rights include the right of access, right of rectification, right to restriction of processing, right to data portability, right to object, and right to not be subject to automated decision making and profiling. So 
let's move on to the next topic I want to cover, which um, involves global mobility management and critical skills for success. There seems to be a never-ending conversation as to how talent mobility professionals can do a better job of securing the proverbial seat at the table within an organization. And Russ touched on this a little bit earlier in some of the information he shared. Olivier Meyer, a Munich, Germany-based principal at Mercer, spent several months speaking with HR professionals and managers from various departments outside of global mobility about what skills truly make a difference for in-house talent mobility professionals in order to make their voice heard and position themselves as strategic partners to the business. Again, I'm not gonna to touch on every one of the skills you see on this slide, so be on the lookout for more information in a future Altair Advisor. One skill is presenting compelling business cases. Few things happen within companies without robust business cases. Unfortunately, as we're probably all aware, management and HR, specifically talent mobility, are not always talking the same language. Being able to present a detailed and relevant business case about the use of certain types of assignments or compensation approaches is essential. Managing policy exceptions, and that's whether you're supporting or opposing those exceptions, is a delicate exercise that needs to be supported by convincing business cases. So linking mobility and talent management is difficult without a business case explaining how this will help drive business growth. Another critical business skill is storytelling. I love this one. We all love a good story, right? You get a group of seasoned global mobility professionals together and you will hear the stories start to fly. Just when we think we've heard it all, someone shares an experience we would have never imagined. Well, in our world, statistics are really worth very little without compelling stories to back them. Storytelling in a business context is not about fairy tales. It's about explaining the bigger story and the overall business objectives. It helps management and assignees put mobility in context and gives mobility a sense of purpose. Another critical skill Meyer identifies is sales skills. Now, selling can sometimes be a much disparaged word that conjures up all sorts of unsavory images. But in reality, selling is not so much about smooth talking as having a structured process that involves preparing well-polished arguments, identifying stakeholders and decision makers, and taking a step-by-step -step approach to reach the goal. Recruiting and motivating assignees is about selling. From a mobility perspective and in the context of the global war for talent, managers have to sell the appeal of assignment destinations, the competitiveness of assignment packages, and easily just the relevance of their mobility policies. The best mobility policy in the world can be a differentiator in terms of attraction and retention only if it is effectively sold and communicated to assignees and management. And then finally, because we haven't heard enough about this, let's touch on the skill of mastering compliance issues. <laughs> compliance encompasses a wide range of issues, as we know, including topics such as tax, immigration, duty of care, social contributions, and work practices. The inherent complexity of compliance and the fact that many different departments, as well as service providers, get involved can lead to fragmented and incomplete compliance management. The risk only increases as companies broaden their definition of mobility and rely more on extended business travel, short-term assignments, commuters, some of those uh, assignment types Russ just mentioned. The challenge for mobility teams is not so much to know every single regulation and potential issue. We all know that's impossible. But the, 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 quite the easy thing to do or the right thing to do is to be able to quickly identify situations that could trigger those compliance problems. And then finally, I just want to spend a moment on diversity and inclusion. We addressed this topic in our 2018 Global Trends Report with information from Altair's partner, Aperion Global. We see this as an ongoing trend that continues to, con to gain momentum. More and more companies are increasing focus on diversity and inclusion, or what some have started referring to as inclusion and diversity. There are companies that have started offering incentives for diverse hiring practices, as well as training to target bias against underrepresented groups. The creation of such initiatives shows a shift in the way companies think about the relationship between diversity and the overall business. Now, this was something that actually came as a surprise to me. In September 2016, Thomson Reuters introduced its Diversity and Inclusion Index, an examination of the diversity practices of 5,000 companies. This move is one indication of the increasing interest in this issue within the business community. 
Some companies are looking beyond employee and leadership diversity to create truly inclusive cultures. Organizations are donating, donating money to political and advocacy groups to provide funding and support for underrepresented groups, for example, and some seek suppliers from varied sources. One example, notably, Procter & Gamble has a staff and supplier diversity program that offers compensation for successful participation in the initiative. One large tech company that has made significant progress is Cisco Systems. They formed a Global Inclusion and Diversity Council in 2007, and that council has sponsored 12 employee research groups with an aim to improve the skills, networking capabilities, and career opportunities for particular groups. Today, five out of 13 people on the executive leadership team at Cisco are women, and the company ranks ninth on the Thompson Reuters Diversity and Inclusion Index. While the Cisco case study is a great example of what's working in regards to diversity and inclusion, leadership positions at a great number of other companies are still largely not diversified. With that, one could argue that companies are creating diversity programs primarily as PR moves rather than a sincere attempt to make measurable changes in the way business is run. The very di discussion of diversity can actually be troubling for some groups. Many companies focus on specific diversity initiatives, such as expanding racial, racial diversity in the workplace or bringing women into leadership and tech positions. However, true inclusivity must also address the needs of LGBT workers, the effects of ageism, and other relevant issues such as immigrant workers. Real inclusion must also take into account the perspectives of employees around the world and the generation of younger workers that is increasingly prominent in the global workplace. The challenges that women experience at headquarters, for instance, might be quite different from those experienced by women in other countries. While women at headquarters may struggle with access to leadership roles, gender discrimination, and sexual harassment, women in emerging market locations may be more concerned simply with safe transit for getting to company facilities social stigma against working mothers with young children, or dual track hiring policies that channel a lot of women into non-professional administration, administrative, excuse me, or temporary worker roles. And then finally, diversity and inclusion. Where do we go from here? Well, we anticipate the remainder of 2018 will bring with it continued change in the profile of assignees. Assignees will be younger and will be more likely to have non-traditional family structures. Assignees will become more diverse and more vocal in challenging a company's lack of diversity. Unfortunately, many companies do not capture or record diversity statistics for assignees, so they're unable to track their own progress, or lack thereof, with regards to diversity among international assignees. Going forward, global mobility professionals will need to be armed with data and information to support certain decisions. Some examples include knowledge of the company's disability policies when resourcing posts in countries where the health provision is not as responsive as in the home country. Global mobility professionals will need to be able to navigate a tricky path in countries where racism and homophobia are prevalent. They will need to be able to justify an insignia population that may not reflect the diversity of society as a whole or even the diversity of the home or headquarters office. In 2018, public and internal pressure will force companies to confront these situations and have robust policies and procedures in place. Global mobility professionals should be prepared to have some challenging conversations with assignees exploring sensitive topics. They must not be overprotective and slip into unconscious bias, nor must they withhold the benefit of their experience of the realities of expat life in certain locations. Finding that balance is going to be key to a successful global mobility team. And that is all I have for today. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for your time and knowledge. We have a moment for just one or two questions. Let's look here. If you haven't answered your question already, please do so within the question drop down on your menu. Um, I do see one question here while we're waiting for the rest to trickle in. Does Altair see companies making policy changes in response to how long it takes to recover the cost to purchase in some areas? Uh, Allison, you wanna take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that we don't have an overwhelming majority of clients that address this. However, we do see some clients um, addressing this in a couple of different ways. 
Um, one would be an instant to rent. If you know that you're going to relocate someone again soon or they are uh, a mover and shaker, if you will, in the company, um, and you know that they're moving to a market that is um, expensive or um, hard to get into, you may incent them to rent for the time being, um, and then uh, in the future, in a, a future move, they may be able to then move back into the home ownership role. Um, we do also see um, some clients allowing those individuals to port those purchase benefits, meaning they aren't penalized if they don't purchase in, in the move where they sold a home and then relocated, um, where typically you would need to be a homeowner in order to have access to that type of benefit. Um, not everyone approaches it that way, but for those that, that do, they may choose certain locations um, and say, if you move to these locations, we recognize that they are difficult for you to buy into, or we don't want to um, push you to purchase into that. So we will allow you to retain that purchase benefit. And then in a future move, when you're moved to a location that's not identified um, as maybe riskier, um, then at that time we would allow you to utilize that benefit even if you're moving as a renter during that move. Wonderful. So hopefully that answers your question. I do see a couple other questions here, but in the interest of time, we'd like to make sure to get those questions answered for you. If you did have a question today, feel free to send it by email. We'll be sure to uh, respond within one week of the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar has been approved for both one CRP and one HRCI credit. Please use the activities shown on your screen in order to submit for credit. Again, we did have a handout, and we do have a handout still available in your drop-down menu if you'd like to save this activity ID for later submission. Before we close today's webinar, I would like to thank Mary Beth, Russ, and Allison for joining us, and especially give our thanks to you all for sharing this valuable information with us. Finally, corporate members of our audience today will receive a $5 gift card in appreciation for attending today's webinar. Keep an eye out for follow-up communication on this in the upcoming weeks. Again, we recognize that your time is valuable, so from all of us here at All